Well, good evening. Welcome again. Glad to have you with us this evening. We're going to go ahead and open with prayer and song before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, now as we come and gather in your name, we thank you for bringing us here. Holy Spirit, you continue to draw us into your presence. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for us to dwell together in your presence, Lord. We come to worship you. We come to lift up your name in song. We come to sit at your feet. We ask, Holy Spirit, now that you would just purge everything, Lord, that is not like you. Every distraction, help us, Lord, to set those things aside. Lord, even in the midst of all the chaos and confusion, Lord, we find peace in you. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you anoint and bless the word of God and, Lord, just cause it to sink deep into our hearts. Let it fall upon fertile soil this evening and bring forth fruit that pleases you. We know you do all things for your glory and we want to decrease even now, Lord, that you may increase in us. And we ask this in your name for your sake. Amen. Open up my eyes in one 
the host of heaven And who else could make every king bow down And who else can whisper in darkness trembles Only a holy God What other beauty Splendor outshines the sun. And what other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. And and behold, and the invites me to call him father only a holy god only my holy god come and be Good evening, and welcome to Calvary Chapel, Richmond. My name is Zach Cawthorn, and uh, some of you guys know me, some of you guys don't. Uh, We've been serving in India for the last eight years, and we come in and out every now and then, but we happen to be here right now, Um, so we're excited to be able to share with you guys. 
Uh, I'm going to share with you guys tonight a bunch of scriptures, and we're going to dive into the Word here in just a minute. And we don't have a whole lot of time, so there may be times where I get really excited and I talk really fast. So just bear with me. Um, But one thing I want to start off with before we dive into the scripture and before I pray is that these teachings, whenever we get up and we have preaching, we have teachings, we have times like this where we're able to get into the Word, they're, they're good for us. They're great for us. But they're not great for us unless we make a change from them. We have to dive in and we have to move on them. Faith is an action verb. That means that faith has to have a step on it for it to come true. If not, it's just belief. I believe in the truth fairy. No, but I have faith that when I sit on my chair that it's not gonna make me fall. The same thing with, with Jesus, the same thing with God, the same thing with all of, our, all of our faith in God is that it has to have action. So as we're stepping and we're walking in this word and as we're reading this word tonight, um, we're gonna have a time where we become and we, we get to an I will statement at the end of this. And what that I will statement means is that it's going to, we're, we're going to come back and we're gonna say, all right, from this word, if this is the word of God, and if it is true, and if the word of God is, as it says in 2 Timothy, um, where am I at? 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And if that is true, then what we read tonight, what we get in the word tonight on, and what we get in the word every time that we get in the word, whether whenever you're in your personal walk, when you're personal reading daily, or, or whenever you listen to a teaching or a sermon or a preach it or anything like that, whenever Whenever you get into that, if you do not step on that, if you do not make a statement, if you do not move on that and it is not held accountable to you, then you know what happens? It's gone. It's gone. The word of God does not return void. Don't hear me saying that. The word of God does not return void, but it does not get the full measure of what it's supposed to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Because I believe if we just listen to teachings and the words never sink in. But I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions tonight. And we're going to hope that those questions really sink into you so that it helps you to form this I will statement. Um, so this I will statement, we want it to be five things. We want it to be smart. We want it to be specific. We want it to be measurable. We want it to be attainable, realistic, and timely. So whenever you make this I will statement, it's something that you, that you need to actually think and craft. Uh, It's not going to be like, oh, I will change my life. That's not an I will statement. It needs to be something that you can actually, it's specific. It's measurable. I will read the scriptures every morning for 10 minutes. If that's what God's telling you, then that's what we want you to do. So this, brothers and sisters, is the first step in discipleship. This is the step in us actually walking out this life. We're not called to be Christians. We're called to be disciples. Um, In Matthew 28, it says, Go and make disciples. Disciples are people who follow after Jesus. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into this. We are the body, and so we also, oh, sorry, we, one, one, one more point. We are the body, so we also need to make this um, shared with other people. We have to be held accountable. We're not a singular person. We are the body of Christ. So in the body of Christ, that means that we have to have others to help us and take us along, to carry us along. So this I will statement, I want you to share it with someone, whether that be your wife, your child, um, whether that be your brother, your sister, one of your friends. It doesn't really matter who you share it with. Someone inside of the body of Christ, share it with that person so that that person can hold you accountable. That person can go along with you and carry this burden. They can say, hey, how are you doing in that? And whenever we don't make, whenever we don't speak something out, it doesn't become real. And also whenever we don't tell somebody, then a lot of times we just slack off on that thing. So we're going to get into that. All right, tonight we are in 2 Corinthians. So get your Bibles out, open them up to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 5 and 6. I'm a bit excited about this scripture. We've got a lot to get through. So I might get really, really excited and go on. But, but I'm going to read this, this scripture first, and then I'm going to pray for us. So we're in 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to read 11 through 6-2. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not condemning ourselves to you again, but giving you a cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you." 
For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now from, from now on, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made, him, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I have listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just ask for your presence. We ask for your spirit to be among us, God. We ask that as we, as we gather, Lord, as we gather in families, as we gather in groups, as we gather together, Lord, to read your word, to study your word, Lord, I, I just ask, God, that you would be in the center of it. Spirit, that you would be in the center of our time and that you would speak clearly and directly to our hearts. Your word is, slices, slices deep. It's able to, to separate bone and marrow. Um, so Lord, we just ask that you would pierce deep into our hearts, just like you did um, all those years ago on the day of Pentecost, God, that you would pierce deep into our hearts, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would tell us and convict us in ways that, that we need to change our lives, that we need to make these I will statements, that we need to do things for your kingdom, God. Um, and that, would, that we would be able to craft these statements and that we would be able to walk on them, that we'd be able to take that action step of faith um, in you. Lord, I pray, for, yeah, I pray for my words to be your words, God, um, or your words to be my words, God. I pray that you would be in the midst of all of it, Lord. Uh, we work uh, only by your strength, only by your spirit, Lord, only by your hands, Lord. So uh, I ask for that. I pray for your spirit to be all over this place. We ask in your powerful, wonderful, amazing name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, forgive me. All right, we're going to go verse by verse through this passage. So we're going to go all the way from verse 11 and 5 all the way through 6 too. And we're going to look at those verses because we're going to actually dig into the scriptures for a bit. So let's take a look at verse 11a, 511a. It says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. I don't know if you guys know much about fear or have you ever had fear happen. Whenever I was in high school, I uh, learned this little trick about something that I was scared of. I was scared of cops, uh, mostly because I had a driver's license and I was 15 and I liked to drive really fast. So I was really scared of cops. So whenever I would see these cops, I would flash my blinkers, my lights, flash my lights to the people that were coming beyond me to persuade them to slow down. Um, I was around 15 and I was driving. I was driving on the interstate and I got caught going, um, I think I was going 94, but I was actually going over 94. I think I was going 99 or something like that and a 70. So the police pulled me over. They gave me a ticket for 94 and a 70. Um, at, at 15, whenever I got caught at that, at that age, uh, I had maybe about $350 to my name and the ticket ended up being about $350. So I got caught for a ticket for 94 and a 70 and I lost all of my money. Everything that I'd been saving up, all the things that I was working for, I lost all of it because of, the punishment was weight, the weight of it was heavy. Um, the same thing, we know the fear of the Lord. We know who God is. If you don't know who God is, let me give you a little crash course. God is the maker of the heavens and the earth. He's the one who set everything into motion. And he's the one who wants to save your soul now. He wants to set everything back in its right track so that we all can be right with him and, see, and spend, spend eternity with him in heaven. That is God but God also is a right judge. And if we do not 
follow in the right track, we do not get back in the right track with God, then there is a heavy weight. There's a heavy punishment that comes with that. And so just like me, whenever I was 15 and I jumped into this this car, I drove really too fast. I got pulled over. The weight was heavy. And to this day, I persuade others not to speed. I tell my wife all the time, I say, don't speed, don't speed. I don't want a ticket. I'm so scared of getting pulled over and going too fast to have getting a ticket. So I persuade others. And us that know Christ, we want to persuade others constantly. We want to tell people constantly about this truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to tell them that Jesus is more, that he is greater, that he is better. And we want to persuade others from that penalty that is to come for them. Um, Verse 10, which is just before that, just kind of confirms all this. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or whether evil. Hebrews 9.27 also confirms it by saying that it is appointed for man to die once and after that will come the judgment. So we know what it is to fear the Lord. We know that judgment's coming. We know that the day is coming. Whether we die or Jesus comes back, we know that judgment is coming. So we know what it is to fear what is coming. And we know what it is, that it is this gonna be horrible. This coronavirus is a, is a really light rumbling as compared to what is coming. And so because of that, we want to persuade others. We want to tell people. We want to share with them. Now, persuading doesn't mean that you had changed people. Whenever I flashed my my lights at people, they had the choice to speed up, to keep going fast, or they had the choice to slow down, to let off the accelerator, hit their brakes so that they didn't get it. Some of the people I know blew past me. The cop pulled them over because I could see them in my rearview mirror. Some of the people slammed on their brakes. Even if they were going the speed limit, they slammed on their brakes because they were scared of the penalty. The same thing. We... As believers, we can't change people. Only God changes people. But it is our duty, it is our job, it is our right, it is our, as we'll see here in just a minute, it is our partnership with God. It is the, the, the job that he has given us to be able to persuade and to walk with people. Yeah, since we know that the judgment is coming, we persuade others. We also know how terrible this judgment it is. Second Peter, um, I'm gonna go, you can flip over to, to Second Peter Actually, we don't even have time to do that. So 2 Peter 2, 4 through 10 is clear. It says, he did not spare angels, the people in Noah's flood who died, nor Sodom and Gomorrah. He blotted them out of existence. This is the stuff that we're, that we're sharing with people because we know the fear of the Lord. We know how terrible of a day it's gonna be. Since we know this, he blotted those things out of existence, threw them into the hellfire. And since we know this, we should be trying our honest best to persuade others. Uh, parents know all about this, persuading our children. We always try to tell our children all the time, hey, don't stick your, the, the fork into the light socket. Don't put your hand on the stove. It's gonna burn you. Don't hit your brother. He's gonna hit you back. We try to persuade our children, telling them, hey, don't do this. We're warning them constantly. Um, and we probably, most of us know this from experience. You know, may, maybe I'm the only one here that knows from experience of actually testing out the theory of sticking a fork into the light socket. I was probably about 18 whenever I tried that. I said, that's not really happened. It doesn't feel good, so you don't want to do that. Um, And because of that, we also try to convince our children of these different things. You know, these are all things that are in the fleshly body. These are all things that are passing. What about our spiritual life? What about our spirit, our soul, the thing that's going to continue on? Shouldn't we be convincing and and trying to convince, trying to persuade more people about that? Shouldn't we be spending more time spending on that, talking with people? Um... Yeah, our body, this shell, will die. We will no longer have this jars of clay, which is 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Um, But our eternal soul will be in either heaven or hell for the rest of eternity. So, brothers and sisters, how are you doing on persuading? How are you spending time persuading people in this hope that you have? Because you know what it is to fear the Lord. How are you doing on persuading? All right, let's get into the rest of this. Let's get into a little bit more. All right, so that's 11A. I'm gonna go into 11B here. I'm gonna read 11A for just a second or more. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is also known to your conscience. 
we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast, out, uh, boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. As followers of Christ, we honestly should be open books. We should be as plain as anyone to see. So what, what does that mean? Broken people need a savior. <laughs> we need a savior. We are lost sinners that for sure need Jesus. So whenever this verse says that what we are to God is plain, or what, what, well, what we are is, what, but what we are is known to God. And I hope it is also known to your conscience. What Paul's saying there is, is I know, God knows that I am a broken, wretched person. Paul says in, his, in, his, in another of his, one of his epistles, he says that I've all, I am the chief sinner. I am the worst sinner, is what Paul says. And what he's saying there is God knows that. He knows everything. Nothing is hidden from his eye. He knows our rights, our wrongs, our comings, our goings, our ins, our outs. He knows everything about us. So it's plain. And Paul's saying, I hope that we've lived in such a way that our life before you has been plain. There should be no blind spots for us as believers. It should, we should be vulnerable. We have to be vulnerable, honestly. If we are the body of Christ and we're living together as one, which is what the body of Christ is, one singular entity, this is my body. It's not in multiple pieces all over the place. We are one body. My elbow knows about my other elbow. My fingers know about my other fingers. My fing these fingers here are plain to my fingers. We have to be vulnerable, brothers and sisters. We have to be vulnerable to each other. This, the days of us being, oh, I'm a good church person. I, I'm, I'm smiling all the time. Everything that everyone sees is great. Whenever someone asks you how it is, oh, great, it's wonderful. It's the best thing in the world. My life is chipper and perfect and I never struggle with anything. Those days are long gone. They should have never come ever. Because once we come into the faith, once we know Jesus Christ, the thing that changes is our eternal outlook. The thing that changes is our soul, our body. We're transformed. But this world still has troubles. John 16, 33 says, in this, it says, it says, in this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There will still be troubles. There will still be problems. There will still be sin. It comes. Paul's not saying that he has lost all sin. He's not saying, hey, look at me, I've become perfect. No, what Paul is saying is that what I am is plain. You can see it, you know it, you can touch it, you can feel it. You should know who I am. And that should also be for us. Paul goes into verse 12. Um, yeah, we, should, we shouldn't be like the Pharisees. Um, but when we know the fear of the Lord, it says in, verse, in the first part of the verse, it becomes are good and not are bad. <laughs> you know, one thing we, we work, uh, before I go into, into verse 12, I'm gonna go back just a little bit. We, we work with Muslims a lot. And one of the, my first questions to my Muslim friends is, does their good outweigh their bad? Because in Islam, you have a scale that your good and your bad goes on whenever you go to judgment. And that good and bad will go. And, and most of my, my Muslim friends will say, well, hey, honestly, my bad outweighs my good. I am much worse than I am better. I'm much better. I'm a much worse person than I am a good person. Um, and so none of us can tip these scales in the favor of us doing good. Romans 3 does a really good job of showing us how we stack up against the law of God. It says that none of us are righteous. None of us are right with God because we've broken his commands. All of this just goes to say that because we know that we are sinners and not in our right standing with God, we are headed towards hell unless we're put right back, bit, put in our Ugh, my words, we, unless we are put in back, put back in right standing with God. Woo, goodness. Let me get a little bit of this juice down here. All right. God knows our true standing with him. We also have to know our true standing with each other. Verse 12, Paul says, I'm not commending myself to you again. I'm, not, I'm just saying you guys know who I am and you should be able to boast about who I am. Uh, you, some of you guys might know who me and my wife are. Uh, we... I have been, my wife came in this church. She kind of grew up in the faith in this church. We got married. I was in this church. We've been gone. We come back and forth and we're a part of this church. This is our home church, Calvary Chapel, Richmond. This is the place that we call home. This is a place that we are um, members of, if you want to say that. Um, this is our church. And so I hope that what we are is plain to you. Some of you guys will say, well, what are you? Oh, well, we are sinners. 
we're broken. We don't, we don't know all the answers. If you follow any of our updates, any of our <clears throat> Facebooks, any of our, if you're in any of our prayer groups, then you know that, man, we've struggled. We've had lots of problems over the years, uh, lots of worldly problems. We've had people coming against us. Right now, we're in America just because of Visa, pro- visa stuff, and so we have problems right now. We aren't able to get back into India because all of the the visas, uh, visas, all of the embassies and everything are closed. So we're struggling with stuff right now. I hope that that is that's plain to you. I hope that you understand. I'm not trying to commend that, but that you may boast. Hey, I know those guys. I know who those guys are. I know what they're doing. I know the way that the wor- the Lord is working in and through them. A boasting. I really love verse 13. Um, it says, if we are crazy, it's because of God. But if we're sound mind, it's because of you. Just think about that for a second. Following Jesus to this world, it is a lot of ways is really crazy. You know, you're talking to yourself, you pray praying, whatever we pray a lot of times, we close our eyes. And sometimes if you're out and you're just praying about, people look at you and they say, hey, are you, are you crazy? Are you just talking to yourself? You know, you want to give all your stuff away to other people. Hey, I've got all this money here. Let me just give it out to people for no reason. You're not storing up things for yourself. You're not sleeping around. You're not doing all these things. That's crazy to the world. It really is. Nowadays, it seems really crazy to the world. Maybe not 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, but it was. When I was growing up, my dad asked me a couple times if I was a homosexual just because I wasn't sleeping around. I wasn't bringing the girls around all the time. Um, it was crazy to him that I wasn't indulging in the things of the world. But I wanted to live a holy life for God. He couldn't comprehend it. He thought, logically, I must prefer guys to girls. It's just crazy to him. It's a crazy thought. It's just an example. But we were able to live in this world with a sound mind. Many of my friends who are Muslim or Hindus, they, they come to me for advice instead of to their Hindu friends or to their Muslim friends, they come to me for advice because of the sound mind that we have. People won't understand it, but they are still and they are drawn to those who follow the Lord because of the clear-headedness that comes from living a holy life that's centered on Jesus. Um, All right, let's, let's step into verse 14 here. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Before I get into verse 14 and 15, I just wanna ask you some questions. Are what you, some questions, these are some questions I was gonna ask you. Is what you are not only plain to God, but is it plain to those around you? Are you living in darkness? Are you living in the light? And the light means all of your flaws are out. Everybody can see it. You've got dark here. Yeah, you're messed up there. And they can come and they can help you. Doctors can't fix you unless they can figure out what your problems are. The same thing with the body of Christ. We can't help you unless we know what's wrong with you. So are you living in darkness or are you living in light? is what you are plain to those around you. Are you trying to keep up some type of facade? What was working on the outside instead of on the inside? That's what Paul said there in verse 12. All right, verse 14 and 15. The true reason, I'm not gonna stand a lot of time on this because I think these verses are very, very clear. The true, true reason we do all of this is as simple as those two verses. Christ's love compels us. It's all because of love. It's all because of love. We know that he has died for all of us and because of that, we have all died with him so that we can live and have a holy life with him. How is that good? It is brought forth because, and how how good, sorry, how good is that? It's all brought forth because of and through the love of Christ. So all of this that we do, any work that we do, it's because of Christ's love compels us. All right, moving on. Verse 16 and 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away because the new has come. Because of what he has done, we're no longer able to, we're, we are no longer able to see with view. We are able to no longer see with physical eyes. We don't, we don't see people by their sin. We see people by the love of Christ. Not that we don't see injustice and we don't see the things that are wrong and we only see the happy about it, but we are able to continue loving someone. 
We're able to continue walking with them. We're able to continue walking through them or walking with them through their sin and down the road. That's that, that being vulnerable, be, being able to be with each other and working with each other. What we are is plain to you because I'm gonna walk with you through your junk. I'm gonna walk with you through your sin because Christ is more because of what he has done. We're not able to sit here. We don't, we don't have to sit here and look and say, that guy right there, he's so bad. No, we can go to that guy and we can say, hey, brother, can I help you? Can I walk with you? Can I help you through this time? But before someone comes to know Christ, they truly judge him by the faith, by, by the flesh. But well, was he a good enough person? Did he do enough good things? But once we come to know him, we're able to understand that the love that drives him and that he, is in, he in himself, this is Christ I'm talking about, is the epitome of love and perfection. And because of that, we are able to become new creations in him. We truly, seriously get a second chance. How crazy is that? You ever won a second chance at anything? You know, the last out, the baseball game, you missed the last strike, you thought you were gonna hit a home run, but you didn't. You want a second chance at that? Um, man, I know I have. But I am so thankful thankful, so thankful that Christ has given me a second chance, actually a real renewed chance with him. And he's refining me daily in that second chance. We are truly new creations in him. Question for you, have you become a new creation in Jesus Christ? What does that new creation look like to those around you? What do people think that new creation looks like? How are you walking it out? Is the love of Christ compelling you? Or is the fear of the world compelling you? Let's get into verse 18. All of this is from God. All of this. Everything is from God. The goodness being made bare. The fear of him wanting to compel folk, wanting to, to love folk. It all is from God. And this is what God did. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and he gave us this ministry of reconciliation. That is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The salvation is from him. It isn't something that we ourselves can grasp hold of. No, he has to do the work. An ant can't go and pick up a car. No, but if, a car, if an ant gets on the bottom of a car and a crane comes and picks it up and moves it over and sets it down, then yeah, you can say, hey man, that ant was a part of that car being moved. That's true. All of this, if Christ did not come and give himself for us, then we ourselves could not have received salvation. We receive it, we receive it. It's not something that we can grasp. It's just like that ant. We are just like that. Christ reconciled us to himself. That's a really crazy statement that he came for a wrong that we had done. Let me give you a crash course real quick. Sat Adam and Eve sinned in the garden of Eden in this perfect world. They, they ate a fruit and they sinned. They brought sin in the world. And we have, we have since been in sin. That's where all this curse comes from, all this bad that comes from sickness, death, um, yeah, Sin, murder, all these things, they all come from that one sin. And we, as their children, continue that on. But Christ, because of that one infraction, because of that one thing that happened, Christ came and he, he's made it better. Um, recon, re, reconciliation is a really, a really hard word for some people to understand. I, I am a very simple person, so I like to use the word fix. God came in, saw that the vase was broken and said, hey, well, I'm gonna fix that vase. And he just picked it up and went, roop through Jesus Christ, and now the vase is fixed. And so we can be the flowers inside of the vase. We can be inside of it. We can do it. So not only did he fix the wrong, but he took it upon himself to do it. And the cool thing about this is that he gave us a job inside of this. He gave us this ministry of reconciliation. If we have received Jesus Christ, we have accepted him, then we've received this ministry of reconciliation. We have a job to do. And our job is to fix, to help people fix things, to help the world be fixed by sharing this good news of Jesus Christ, by sharing what God has done, to sh that he has reconciled the world to himself through Jesus Christ. 
We've been given a responsibility. Do you remember whenever you were a kid, little kid, and you, were, and you constantly wanted responsibility? You would say, Mom, I can do that. Mom, can you give me a dog? Can you give me a puppy? Can you give me a fish? And they would say, no, that's a big responsibility for a little person. And you'd say, give me a responsibility. Now we just kind of shirk responsibility. We don't really want that anymore. But do you remember as a kid, whenever you wanted that responsibility? We really relished in the idea of proving ourselves as responsible. Well, God's given us a responsibility as ministers of reconciliation. And what a great responsibility we've been given by God. It's a job, a pleasure. We've been given, one, the news that he has reconciled the world to himself, but two, that reconciliation between each other can happen too. And we ourselves are the stewards of that reconciliation how many of us in this room, or how many of us in, in, at home, how many of you guys uh, have broken parts in your life? Relationships that are broken, marriages that are broken, children's relationships that are broken. How many things are broken in your life that you need to seek out reconciliation on? Reconciliation is not an easy thing. Fixing something is not easy. You don't just take your car to the... To the um, to the auto mechanic because it's broken because you know how to fix it yourself. No, you take it to the auto mechanic because it's, some, it's a knowledge that you don't have or a time that you don't have that needs to be fixed. So you let the auto mechanic fix it. Reconciliation, it takes time, it takes energy, but God wants to reconcile us all back to himself and he wants to make the world right, right back where it was. My dad has a commercial maintenance business. So from the time I was about 14 or 15 until the time I was in her 20s, I worked for the family company. Now, as a 14 to 17-year-old, I didn't have a lot of knowledge of how to fix things. I'd go into a, a McDonald's, and there'd be a fry vat, an AC, a, um, everything in there my dad fixed. And it, they would have things that were broken. So my dad would send me out to these job, these, uh, job sites, and he would say, all right, I want you to go to McDonald's six hours away, and I want you to go and fix this thing. And I'd be like, Dad, I don't know how to do that. He said, once you get there, just call me. Once you get there, just call me. Hold on to that thought. I'm going to read the next couple of verses. Uh, verse 20 through verse 1. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made him to be no sin, to made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the God to receive the grace of God in vain. So you got that thought in your head. God sent me, oh my God, my, my dad sent me out to go fix something at this store that I have no clue. I've never even seen this thing before. I have to literally walk into the store and say, hey, uh, sir, where's your fry vat? My, I, I'm, I'm here to fix your fry vat. And I'm a four, 15, 16 year old kid with a curly afro and they look at me like I'm crazy. And then I walk, they show me where it is. And then I walk over there and I, uh, the first thing that I do, my dad said, call me. I pick up the phone and I start, I call him. I say, dad, I'm at the fry vat. He says, okay, what does it look like? And I say, well, this is what it looks like. And I explain it. And my dad was pretty amazing. He would sit there and he would tell me step by step how to symptom, how to, how to take the symptoms of this thing and figure out what was wrong so I could fix it, so that I could reconcile it, make it right. And that's what God has given us. He's given us the, 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 the job to go and, and reconcile things not by ourselves. It's not something that we're supposed to do. It's not like I see this person doing something wrong and I say, hey, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. No, we have to go with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading us, God telling us, but our hands are the ones that are getting dirty. We're the ones that are getting into the muck with the people. And God wants us to do that. He wants us to be plain before each other so that we don't live in the dark, so that we can work with each other, so that our hands can get dirty, so that we can be bonded and closer together. He was the one that was guiding me the whole way my dad was. And the same thing, the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us. We, as ministers of reconciliation, are just like what I experienced as a kid. We're led by the Holy Spirit. Marriages, parent, kids' problems, family problems, forgiveness, we are, all call, we are called as peacemakers to bring reconciliation to every aspect of our lives, but also the lives around us. 
Where we live in India, most people live in joint families. And a lot of these impoverished communities isn't unlikely to find family that has about three to five different separate families living in a house. So you got a brother and his wife and his kids, a mom and a dad, then another brother and his wife and his kids and mom and dad, maybe a cousin and his wife and his kids. And then you might even have a second mom and a dad over there that are, these guys are brothers up here. Then you've got three sets of sons that have their own families. And you, so you might have you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 people living in a house together. Um, and inside of these house, it houses, it, is, it isn't unlikely um, that even inside these extremely close quarters and, yeah, these extremely close quarters, it isn't unlikely to find that moms and dads don't talk to each other that kids and moms don't talk to each other. Brothers and sisters don't talk to each other. They, are, they, have, they have done what they call rishta katam. That means you've cut off the relationship, but you live together, but you haven't talked to each other in 10, 12 years. The relationships are totally shattered. The good news is that reconciliation is what God is in the business of doing and also what he's put us in the business of doing. We are called to bring his reconciliation of fixing of things to the world. We are his repairman. Where's repairman? Led by his spirit and this voice and, and his voice to bring things back into the way that they were supposed to be. Let's go into verse two. For he says, in a favorable time, I've listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is stuff for today. It's not stuff for tomorrow. Um, one, of my, one of my good friends recently told me, I'd never heard this. I should have probably heard it before. But he says, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. How true is that? We and ourselves need to do this now. The day of salvation is today. If you've been waiting on Jesus, today is the day. If you've been waiting to talk to your brother or sister, today is the day. If you've been waiting to talk to your mom, your friend, whoever, your boss, today is the day. The, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that we're able to be saved from these things. Today is the day that we're able to reconcile our relationships. Reconciliation is for today, brothers and sisters. All right, so we're coming to a halt here, coming to a close. Our time's about up, um, but I wanna take a couple of minutes and I wanna ask you about your I will statement. If this is the word of God, if this is true, if what I read in 2 Timothy is true earlier, and if this is the word of God and it is our food and it is what we need, what are you gonna do about it? How does this change your life? How does it make you closer to God? How does it make you holy? What are you gonna do about it? What's your action step? What's the faith part of this? Let's take about two minutes um, to craft an I will statement. You can take more time. It doesn't have to be in this two minutes, but let's take about two minutes. and Just think, what was, what was God telling you? What sparked you? What was hard in there that you didn't like, that you heard? What was good in there that you said, that's something that I need to do? What relationships need to be fixed in your life? We can't continue with all these broken relationships. We just can't. Today is the day to fix them. Marriages have to be fixed today. Our relationships with our children have to be fixed today. Our relationship with our friends have to be fixed today. As far as is concerning to you, as much as you can, you can't do all of it, but as much as you can, we have to do it. And if it's just, if your real statement is, I need to grab this person's hand to help me with this, that's okay. This week, I will do this. Take about... Two minutes to do this. Let's make an I will statement. Let's prove Jesus right and that he is the reconciler of this world, that he's reconciled the world to himself. And let's prove him true. We already know he's true, but let's prove him true 
that he's given us the job. He's given us a task. He's let us be partners with him to be ministers of reconciliation. Now that you've got your I will statement, and even if you don't, think about it. Take that I will statement and share it to someone. Today, today, while today is today, while it's called today, today, share it with someone so that that person can hold you accountable. Make it smart, remember, specific, measurable, attainable, timely, oh, I missed one, realistic and timely, timely. Make sure that you can do it this week, in the next two weeks, sometime that's, that's close by so that you can make this stuff happen. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we, uh, we bless your name. God, your word is good, your word is powerful, your word is mighty, and we thank you for it. We thank you that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord. Lord, let it pierce our hearts, let it pierce our minds. Hey, mine, Lord, let it pierce me, God. Lord, I pray for reconciliation over all brokenness, Lord. Our brokenness to you first, God. Our brokenness in our relationships, our brokenness in our families, our brokenness in our church, God. I know that we have people inside of our church that don't even talk to each other because there's brokenness there, Lord. I don't know about in this church, but Lord, the, the universal body of Christ, Lord, your body, we have it. We have brokenness. People who talk to, can't even talk to each other, can't even hold a conversation, who literally despise the other person. Lord, I pray your reconciliation over it. Spirit, you're into the business of reconciliation. Reconcile these things to yourself, Lord, because I know that it is by the love of Christ that we are compelled, Lord. You move us forward by your love, and we are made a new creation in you, Jesus. Through reconciliation, new life comes. It's a new creation, Jesus. So I just ask for that, Lord. If there's anybody that, that doesn't know you and they want to be reconciled to you right now, Lord, I just pray that that person would do it. Today is the day of salvation. If there's anybody who's been wandering away from you and they need to be reconciled to the things that they've done right now, Lord, I pray that those people would, would do that right now, Lord. They would get on their face right now, wherever they are, God. And they would be reconciled to you. Let your reconciliation come. Let your spirit rest on us, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right, guys, take that word. Let it be good to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessings.